slight delay, but um, there, was, there was a few people still coming up and down in the in the elevator. So I would like to welcome you to this EPC policy dialogue, um, which focuses on justice and accountability, prerequisites of lasting peace in Ukraine. Since the beginning of Russia's full-scale war against Ukraine, the Kremlin has systematically carried out the most grotesque war crimes and crimes of aggression against Ukrainians, including civilians and children. In fact, Russia has purposely targeted civilians, including in areas that are very far away from the war zone. Putin and his cronies have no regard for human life, human rights or international law. I guess we can all remember the atrocities that were unearthed in Bucha at the very beginning of the war. Unfortunately, this was not the only first horror stories in a series. Many more atrocities have since taken place. For example, recently Russia purposely launched missiles on a cafe in the town of Horoza in the Kharkiv region, killing over 50 civilians. I mean, done on purpose, huh? it wasn't an accident. Russia has also unlawfully detained thousands or tens of thousands of Ukrainian civilians, and these numbers only continue to increase. They are abducted, incarcerated, tortured, killed, uh, and in many cases, even sexually violated. Some are held in Russia and Belarus, others in Ukraine's occupied territories. Many of these people just seem to vanish into thin air. Nobody knows where they've gone. Russia has also forcibly deported thousands of Ukrainian children to Russia or to areas under its occupation. They are given Russian citizenship, forcibly adopted into Russian families, and obstacles are created to their reunification with their parents and homeland. This is a war crime, and for this reason, the ICC issued arrest warrants for President Putin and Russia's Children's Rights Commissioner, Marie Lvova Belova for their involvement. While Putin, uh, very unfortunately, is not yet behind bars, um, his ability to travel the world has significantly been reduced. But I think we can all agree we'd very much like to see him behind bars uh, as soon as possible, and not only him. Russia must be held accountable for these crimes and all the other war crimes it has committed throughout the decade, including most recently in Syria, where Russian jets continue to bomb civilian infrastructure almost every day. So I want to welcome you all um, to this event where we're going to be discussing um, these issues and many other issues. Um, just a quick um, update on the run of the show. First of all, it's really a big honor um, to welcome back to EPC um, Andrei Kostin, Ukraine's Prosecutor General, in fact, I don't know whether you will recall, but you actually spoke in one of our events um, earlier this year, but online. Um, so it's very nice to actually meet you in person um, for the first time. Um, he is joined by Iris Abraham, who's sitting um, over here, uh, communication and policy advisor at the cabinet of Vice President Dubravka Suitska at Democ Democracy and Democ Demography and Europe at the European Commission. Um, and finally, last but not least, um, Niels Brent, who's Deputy Director of DG Just at the European Commission, who was also with us earlier this year. So it'd be very good to get an update from you um, on what we spoke about then um, and how we are today. Once we've heard the uh, interventions from all of the speakers, we will move to the audience and Q&A. And just a quick word for the journalists that are present um, we would also welcome you to a small press conference with the Prosecutor General afterwards um, in the room next door, I think. Um, but for now, I'd like to give the floor to the Prosecutor General, um, who, by the way, also recently published an article for the International Bar Association called Of Jailers and Tortures. And I can tell you it's, it's very worth a read. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you. A distinguished audience, dear colleagues, I'm glad that we have an opportunity to discuss and debate Ukraine's question for justice and accountability in response to 
Russia's unprovoked and unjustified aggression against Ukraine that represents a flagrant violation of the UN's Charter's prohibition of the use of force against territorial integrity and sovereignty of our state. We would all agree that Europe has not witnessed such act of an aggression, such scale of the international crimes since the Second World War. As we speak, Ukrainian soldiers continue to defend our freedom, sovereignty and people, but most importantly, the very essence of peace and security in Europe. Therefore, it's not merely our war, it is a global war, undermining the rule-based international law and order. For past 20 months, we have seen it all. Ukrainian residential areas and millions of civilians being subjected to massive shelling and indiscriminate attacks far beyond the war zone. Occupied cities like Bucha, Sumy, Chernigiv, Izum, and Kherson becoming a playground for atrocities and massacres. Torture, sexual violence, and other inhuman acts against Ukrainian prisoners of war and detained civilians are being orchestrated as a part of a state policy to intimidate instill fear, punish, or extract information and confessions. As if these atrocities were not enough, Russia tries to strip us of our future by forcibly deporting thousands of Ukrainian children to its territory, changing their identity and nationality, and putting them for adoption in Russian families. There is no denying that it is a Russia's planned policy aimed to smear Ukrainian identity by robbing us of our children. It is universally recognized that without justice, there is no peace. We firmly believe that grasping this momentum and ending impunity for international crimes is not only paramount for Ukraine's path towards justice, freedom and victory, but for European and global security, peace, and stability. We demand a just peace for Ukraine. We will not be content with a hybrid one, and there are several reasons for that. First, international community has learned hard way that Russia's legacy has no moral compass, humanity, and consciousness. For past several decades, Russia's repeatedly undermined human rights and rule-based international order with cycle of military interventions in Chechnya, Georgia, Ukraine, and Syria. Sorry. Till today, the accountability for these violations and crimes has been largely lacking, which has paved the way for Russia's aggression against Ukraine and its heinous crimes. Kremlin tyranny is a living symbol of violence, hatred, and terrorism, but most importantly, the cruelty of power. None of us can afford to compromise with such delirious venture of domination. Accountability is a fair response to these actions, but it's also a strong deterrent so that all autocratic regimes have a clear understanding of the consequences they face for breach of international rules. Common sense of mankind demands that the law shall not stop with the punishment of ordinary soldiers. It must also reach those who possess themselves of great power the leaders that make deliberate and concerted use of force and violence. That's why our quest for justice and accountability has a very specific path with wide range of actions. And most importantly, we owe justice and redress to victims and survivors of this war. We have no more, no moral right to fail them. With that in mind, it's natural and logical that justice and peace are mutually reinforcing initiatives and imperatives. In such situations, accountability becomes a 
precondition for sustainable peace and stability. In this regard, our vision has been summarized in Ukraine's peace formula proposed by President Zelensky. It's a global initiative addressing radiation safety, food and energy security, release of detainees, restoration of Ukraine's territorial integrity, withdrawal of Russian troops, and cessation of hostilities, restoring justice, environmental safety, etc. Ukraine believes that it is a war forward to make the world safer, proposing concrete modalities to achieve it. We firmly believe that ensuring justice and accountability can be achieved through mobilizing national and international capacity in order to impose responsibility on Russian state, as well as each and every individual perpetrator. And if the existing international legal framework is not fully adequate and responsive, we need to be proactive and invest in new initiatives. From day one of full-fledged aggression of the Russia into Ukraine, our fundamental objective and central focus has been to ensure that all incidents are documented, thoroughly investigated in line with international standards, perpetrators identified, and held accountable for crimes committed. To achieve this, Ukrainian law enforcement agencies have been working around the clock and often risking their own safety and security. This is so since we understand that even though we work hand in hand with international community, holding perpetrator accountable is primarily the responsibility of the national criminal jurisdiction. And hence, the bulk of the investigations and the largest number of prosecutions will be and should be done by Ukraine itself. In parallel, we have invested in designing new policies and strengthening institutional capacities. We have developed a strategic plan for prosecution of international crimes in close cooperation and with engagement of our international partners. It will allow us to streamline our practices, to improve interagency cooperation and partnership with external stakeholders. We have increased specialization of the prosecutors in international crimes on central and regional levels, as well as introduced victim-oriented approaches in our daily work. Our success lies in hands of our investigators and prosecutors and deeply value their commitment and determination. Securing accountability for the crime of aggression, the mother of all international crimes remains high on our agenda. Existing gap in the international justice architecture should not pose as an obstacle for securing responsibility for those who planned and ordered that war. In this regard, we already have a significant achievement with the launching of the International Center for the Prosecution of the Crime of Aggression in July of this year in The Hague. The ICPA, which is an integral part of the Joint Investigation Team, serves as an operational hub for documenting, gathering, and analyzing all relevant evidence. The final accord in this direction will be setting up of a special tribunal for the crime of aggression. It is a crucial that our common efforts are directed towards expanding the support for the tribunal and making it functional. Political support and advocacy on this matter is vital for ensuring long lasting and just peace not only in Ukraine, but worldwide. We all need to remember that after Nuremberg trials and trials for Far East, at the end of Second World War, no one in the world was even tried to be prosecuted and punished for the waging of the aggressive war. We need together to solve this problem. Because previous wars and conflicts which leave, which left this issue open, who is an aggressor? And aggressor was not punished for the crime of aggression. It left a lot of tension in the international community, and this tension enters again and again, raising more and more conflicts in the future. That's why it's our common joint obligation of the international community to 
stand together and to create a special tribunal. Otherwise, another potential aggressors will feel this potential impunity and we will unfortunately see more wars and conflicts in the other parts of the globe. Then, fostering effective cooperation and coordination between Ukrainian and international judicial institutions at all stages of documenting and collecting uh, instances and evidence of atrocious crimes, their investigation and prosecution is key for e effective and comprehensive adjudication of international crimes. Therefore, we are nurturing these relations of trust that has developed among my office and the relevant international mechanisms. International Criminal Court, ICC, has admirable leadership as an international criminal justice institution. We commend the Office of the Prosecutor of the ICC for steady initiation of the investigation and efforts undertaken in response to the atrocities committed by Russia in Ukraine. The arrest warrants issued by the court for Putin and Lvova Belova are both historic and symbolic. Ukraine and Ukrainian people are awaiting for the justice to be served in the name of all victims who have suffered, lost their children, families, friends, and relatives. These warrants are an explicit echo of truth. Without accountability of the very top of Russia's leadership, there can be no peace at all. We have also shown our commitment via close cooperation with the ICC, sharing of the available evidence, as well as amendment of Ukrainian legislation to make the court's work operational on the ground. We will continue this partnership. We are also in regular dialogue with the UN Independent International Commission of Inquiry on Ukraine, the OSCE Fact Finding Commission, the UN Special Procedures, and others. Fostering bilateral and multilateral interstate partnership for investigation and prosecution of international crimes has been the key direction of our international efforts from the very beginning of Russia's full-fledged invasion. To date, we have established a cordial and consistent framework of cooperation with our partners and friends, be it on bilateral or multilateral levels. I wish once again to stress the importance of interstate partnership in the framework of the joint investigation team together with six member states, along with the ICC and United States being partner members of JIT. So far, we have managed to establish an efficient framework that enables the exchange of information, facilitates and strengthens the capacity of investigation into international crimes. This allows us to find synergies in our efforts for legally responding to those committing atrocities against Ukraine and Ukrainians. We have effective bilateral cooperation with over 20 states that are pursuing national investigations into international crimes committed in Ukraine. Close coordination, streamlining prosecutorial policies and sharing information and evidence is at core of this cooperation. Just today, I have meeting with Commissioner Reinders. And once again, I send uh, words of gratitude to him and partners who created a unique mechanism within Eurojust, the CSET, Core International Crimes Evidence Database, unique instrument which allows us as a countries who are conducting investigation of international crimes committed by Russia in Ukraine to exchange evidence and information about evidence in practically automatic, in an automatic uh, uh, level. This uh, base will be fully operational from November this year, and it works in pilot regime, and it already gives us, brings us fruitful results. Because many pieces of evidence are collected in different member states, because there are Ukrainian refugees who were victims or witnesses of war crimes, and who, who uh, address the police and other, and other law enforcement authorities in these countries and providing them with their evidences. But it may happen that pieces of evidence of one crime will be located in different jurisdictions. And the CSED database under the auspices of Eurojust helps us to combine all these pieces of evidence into one 
single case. Needless to say that reparation of damage is crucial for victims and survivors. It's also a crucial element in a reconstruction plan for Ukraine. We seek redress through lawful measures, sanctions, and setting up of international compensation mechanism. In this regard, a personalization of the register of damage through an enlarged partial agreement is a first step in the right direction in order to gather and secure evidence of damage and injury caused. Let me also be honest with you. Our quest for justice and accountability is full of challenges, and it would not be an easy process. We need to understand that the task ahead of us will require not only years, but maybe decades of commitment. What does it mean in practice? Ensuring comprehensive implementation of Ukraine's peace formula, unified efforts for securing short-term term and long-term objectives for sustainable justice system in Ukraine, addressing the needs and challenges while being coherent in our ways without compromising our values and principles. Therefore, we hope you will embrace our approach with urgency, but also with durability. Our efforts to bring Russia to account and to rebuild Ukraine, Ukrainian justice system holistically will be projects of many years. It's probably Ukraine's, and I would say the international community's last chance to get this right. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Prosecutor General, for this really overarching um, speech where you touched on um, very many different and all very important issues, um, to which I would like to come back to some of them um, quite shortly. Um, but before I move to the rest of the panel, I would like to ask you um, a question related to the kidnapping of kids, which you, which you have mentioned. I mean, Ukraine is initiating this Kids Back to Ukraine initiative. Um, could you sort of elaborate um, a bit more about, about this? Um, and also, your office has repeatedly called for an international coordination mechanisms to stop um, this heinous practice. Um, is this something that has already been started, um, or is there challenges to actually mo moving this forward? Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, we all understand that uh, making perpetrators accountable for these, one of the most heinous war crimes that Russians are committed does not automatically bring back Ukrainian children home. That's why uh, we are combining our efforts uh, together with other state institutions, with our international partners, with international organizations in order to bring back our children home, especially those who are too young, too small, even to know that they are Ukrainians. This approach brings us result. We see more and more children returned home. At the moment, about 300 and around 390 children are back in Ukraine. But we need to combine more efforts, especially on international level, in order to put pressure on Russia to bring all of our children back home. I, when I was at UN side event on deportation of Ukrainian children, I mentioned that UN, UN was very active. And I would say, um, successful in feeding children from another countries by Ukrainian grain, with Ukrainian grain initiative. I would say that UN and other institutions should be more active in order to 
push Russian authorities to return back home Ukrainian children. I believe that there are a lot of instruments how to do it. There is a set of international legislation and children could be returned via third countries, via international organizations and mechanisms. The only thing is how to make Russia understand that they need to do it. And we are also approaching uh, not only criminal instruments of uh, uh, making them accountable for these crimes, because any, any accountability, as a matter of fact, is not only to punish the exact perpetrator, it's also to deter the others for, from committing such crime. And when sending such signals together with sanctioning a lot of Russian individuals who are involved in this illegal practice, it should also pay its role in order for the others not to be involved in this, uh, in this activity in Russia. Um, some of them, it's my understanding, some of them think that they just perform the order of the highest authorities or higher authorities in Russia. But let's come back to the uh, records of Nuremberg trials. Some of Nazi uh, war criminals, they also try to say that they just performed the order. And this is very important when we make them accountable and when the imposing sanctions over uh, tens or, or hundreds of them, this is about to send them a signal that you're not just performing the illegal law, let's say like this, because national law could not be uh, contradicting the international humanitarian law. This is nonsense. And they need to understand that they will, they will be accounted for these violations of international law. But my message for is the the next. I mean, uh, I, I I have a message saying that every day world leaders should be vocal about this crime and should be vocal about ne necessity to return our children back home to Ukraine and to their families. This is extremely important. We can't just pay attention to this from event to event, from conference to conference. We need to be vocal every day. And when Russians understand that they have no other way, they will start to release our children. This is, the, uh, this is uh, what I believe in. That's why this um, activity uh, on international level is extremely important. I would say not only children, we have also civilian detainees. So grown-ups who are illegally kidnapped from Ukrainian land and they're illegally detained in Russia and on temporarily occupied territories. And we need to be vocal internationally because their children are waiting for them in Ukraine. And these, there are thousands of them. Their relatives are waiting for them. And this is also a tragedy for their families. And we need not, not to forget about them. And if we are talking about deportation of children, let's not forget about all other crimes committed against Ukrainian children in the course of this war. Killing. They are wounded. They are sexually assaulted. They lost their physical and mental health. And we need not to forget about these types of crimes. So children who are suffering from this war is absolutely medieval system. It's something which we never expect to be happening in 21st century. Well, we never expect, but it is happening, huh? unfortunately. And I'm going to stay on the topic of children um, and turn to Miss uh, Abraham. Um, because this is um, part of your, your dossier. So it would be interested to hear about the work um, that the Commission slash EU is doing um, in related to Ukrainian children. I mean, I know you're doing work in Ukraine, but also for Ukrainian children that are in, in the EU. 
So the, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, Amanda. And uh, thank you very much, Prosecutor General. Pleasure to be again with you. And thank you for your very powerful words and, and all your incredibly um, work. Um, we, of course, uh, with the cabinet of Vice President and Vice President Schwitzer, we've been engaged in support to Ukrainian children since the onset of that war. And uh, the commitment uh, is very high. We are working with all Ukrainian forces together on supporting children inside and outside the EU. And the Vice President herself, uh, although she has the title Democracy and Demography, is officially also in charge of children's rights and child protection in the, in the Commission. So in that capacity, I am also here just as a little way of introduction. Um, as the Prosecutor General has, um, has pointed it out, for 20 months now, a generation of Ukrainian children has experienced fear, loss, tragedy, and violence. And in a split second, they had to leave the life they knew behind them. Their friends, their schools, everything they knew. And Russia's illegal war of aggression against Ukraine is having a devastating impact on all Ukrainians, but especially children, and we see it. In conflict, it's the children who are the most vulnerable and who bear most of the brunt of it. And this is no different here. And you spoke at the, at the end of your, of your intervention about international cooperation and the partnership. And this is very encouraging to see, because since the onset of that war, we've seen an enormous amount of efforts being fielded by all actors, um, be it in the European, but also in the international context. Our Vice President has been together with you at the United Nations um, high-level event during the General Assembly on this very topic. And we saw an enormous outpour support from all member states of the UN, from the United Nations, the European Union, all actors involved. So this is extremely encouraging. And we, if we keep that support, I agree, we can really, really achieve what, what is needed here. Now, you asked me to speak a little bit about what the European Union did. So since the onset of the war, we have spared no efforts to support Ukrainians. You all recall the historic um, activation of the Temporary Protection Directive, which offers immediate protection to over more than 4 million people, including children who have fled to the European Union from Ukraine. We have provided unprecedented financial, military and humanitarian support to Ukraine, I think many of you are aware of the numbers, but I will just highlight that currently the EU amount uh, support amounts to around uh, 77.5 billion um, euros, and where 17 billion has been made available from the EU budget for member states, which are hosting people under the temporary protection, so meaning also the frontline member states. To this, the protection of children really stands absolutely central. There are about one and a half million children who have crossed the border into the European Union. And as you also could observe, many of them are unaccompanied, some are orphans, others are separated from their parents. And these children are particularly vulnerable and require your, potential, your our particular attention. A significant number of these children also come from institutions in Ukraine, and they really require all our support which is also something the vice president has very much taken her attention to. The European Union and its member states offer protection, shelter, access to health care, psychosocial support, which you mentioned is extremely important, and education to Ukrainian children. We've seen them enrolled across the EU. Uh, we now, it's not yet sufficient. The rate of enrollment is not yet sufficient, but it is increasing, and member states are feeling more and more efforts to that, because we also see that uh, the support to education, the enrollment might need a little bit more of a long-term attention. Um, what is central to this is the serving the best interests of the child. And this is a principle in our child rights work, which applies to each and every child. That also means that when building back better, which is also the, the approach we have taken during the London Reconstruction Conference of Ukraine, we will need to prioritize the children. This is a priority on the EU side, but also, as you mentioned, the priority on the Ukrainian side, because clearly that Ukraine cannot be rebuilt without its children. So let me zoom in a little bit on um, the child care reform efforts that we are doing to which President von der Leyen has taken personal interest. Many of you may remember uh, the visit of the um, entire College of Commissioner to Kiev on the 2nd of February this year, where President von der Leyen also publicly stated her commitment to support 
a comprehensive childcare reform, reform in Ukraine, which now has really the strong support and engagement of the First Lady of Ukraine, Oryna Zelenska, and the President. And this engagement and support is central and absolutely key. Um, a package worth 10 million euros will support Ukraine in building this new strategy. There is now a new uh, coordination office set up in Kiev. Uh, for the child care reform, reform coordinator with whom we're actually working closely together. We're working on a, on, a, on a conference now that will take place in November here to rally more member state support around this child care support, but also to make it very clear this is a long-term process. It doesn't happen overnight. It hasn't happened overnight in many of our member states, and it really goes in line also with Ukraine's European aspirations. And we are there to accompany it with technical support, with expertise, but also with our own lessons learned from child care reform in many of the EU member states to really build this capacity inside uh, Ukraine. And uh, we also really bring home the message and work together with our partners in Ukraine that any reconstruction effort must, a national reform um, process must mainstream child rights and needs throughout. So while we speak about child care, we also need to speak about the overall context of child rights. And there the EU has a lot of expertise and experience to offer. And again, we do this hand in hand with our Ukrainian partners. One point is extremely key in this is to overcome the trauma. And I will come to this also later as I uh, address the issue of accountability, which I will delve into very quickly now. Um, it is very clear and we wholeheartedly agree that we need to hold accountable those responsible for the illegal deportation and transfer of Ukrainian children. It is clearly, part of the great violations against children, also under the UN mandate of children and armed conflict to which we completely align with. Um, it is a terrible crime. It inflicts unimaginable supper, suffering on both the children and the parents. And I think none of us is able to put themselves in this situation. Um, we support very much the arrest warrants by the International Criminal Court. Um, as you say, it is historic and it is highly important. And it really sends, sets an important political sign that there is no carte blanche. There is no getting away with this. Perpetrators will be taken into account, will be held accountable. And this is, as you say, a very global signal we are setting. And it's important to see this through and to really, really see this through towards the end. And in that context, again, we thank you very much for your work, for your engagement. We could not do this without it, without you. And please, please count on our, our unwavering support to this. Um, you mentioned investigations, indeed. So in, either, in order to really hold perpetrators accountable, we need very comprehensive investigations. We need access. We need the data. We need the verification of these crimes. And these investigations need to focus on the six grave violations against children during conflict. They are killing, maiming, attack on hospitals, attack on schools, abductions, as well as denial of access to humanitarian aid. And they are also enumerated by the Security Council in its, in, in its resolution. And we could see this this year on the 5th of July, when the latest report of the UN Secretary General was issued on this, that um, Russia was put on the list of the perpetrators. And this is extremely important. And we very much support this, this mandate as well. Um, the EU also strongly supports the UN Independent Commission of Inquiry on Ukraine um, in a sense, and of course, all the work of the EU, of the International Criminal Court, but my colleague will delve much more into this uh, into these, um, support. Um, we want to really build on the few successes so far in returning Ukrainian children, as you say, there are about 390. Through our cooperation with Ukrainian authorities, with non-governmental organizations, there are a number of NGOs actually inside Ukraine, such as Magnolia, who are extremely courageous, extremely effective. And we do support this. We cooperate with the United Nations agencies and the International Committee for the of the Red, for the Red Cross. So no one can do this alone. Only if we all pull together, we can really act and make a difference there. We very much welcome the creation of an international expert group in Kiev and look forward to actively engaging with Ukrainian authorities on finding these urgent solutions for the safe return of children. We know that more can be done and should be done for victims of war aggression, including children, and also very much acknowledging and recognizing that victims of war have a right to criminal accountability. And this is an ambiguous under international law. 
Um, accountability must be holistic. We need to also cover the right to truth, repar reparation and non-repetition. And non-repetition is against the message that we need to send. No one can get away with these crimes. And if it, this is very clear, then we can hopefully also in the long term prevent more of these crimes from happening. And a word on trauma. We must not forget that if we wish to rebuild and reconstruct an entire society, we must address trauma. This is key. This is key to breaking cycles of violence. It is tree key to healing and any form of a normal life of these children. Because Ukraine cannot be rebuilt without these ch children. And therefore, in the part of our reconstruction efforts, this psychosocial support must stand central, which is also indispensable to achieving this just peace and sustainable peace. So thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer any questions later on. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you also for the, the, the important work um, that the Commission's doing. Because I was trying to think if there was another example in the world where children have been um, kidnapped, particularly on this scale, um, where you could sort of learn. Um, but I mean, I, can't, I actually couldn't think of a single example, not a single one. Um, OK, so. Thank you. And I'm going to move on now to, to you, uh, Nils, um, to change the topic um, a bit, because I want to return to the crime um, of um, aggression. And as I mentioned at the beginning, you were with us in, um, I think it was actually in February, uh, where we discussed this uh, and about the, um, well, then it was in the early days, the establishment of the International Centre for the Crime of Aggression, which has now been launched um in the hague so it would be great to hear from you where we are actually with that what has been you know achieved so far and what are the challenges um in about 10 minutes top tops is that okay um and then we'll go to to um to to, to q a with the audience because i know we're on quite a tight um schedule so i'll give the, the floor to you Thanks a lot, uh, Amanda. Uh, colleagues, um, perhaps before moving to the crime of aggression, let me take one step uh, back, um, going back to, to the heart uh, that drives us uh, forward. There are uh, outrageous crimes being committed, have been committed uh, during the war in Ukraine, are still committed day by day. And in response to those crimes, uh, ensuring full accountability that not a single crime uh, remains uncommitted, really lies at the heart of your efforts, uh, Prosecutor General, lies at, at the heart of our efforts. Uh, for the two reasons that have been addressed, first, to deter further crimes from being committed. It's very important that every crime is prosecuted to send the message uh, to every soldier in the, the command line, from the top down to the bottom, before you commit any further crime, reflect what you're doing. You may be taken responsible yourself. That's what we as global community want to go after. But also the second reason, the longer term reason, every war, every crime leaves deep scars. For them to heal, you need to come to justice. It's so important if we want to, and you also explained that, if we want to rebuild uh, the society in Ukraine, but not only in Ukraine, it's a global effort. If we want to, to uh, rebuild longer lasting peace, this sense that justice is achieved needs to be delivered. That's absolutely critical. And that's why we are working uh, on two levels. One is to use existing structures to ensure justice and accountability. The second uh, layer is to, to fill the gaps that we have. But Amanda, that's, uh, the, the, let's say the crime of aggression concerns the second level. But allow me a few uh, comments still on the first level. Uh, to ensure full accountability uh, and justice, of course, is first and foremost a responsibility of Ukraine and their prosecutor general really uh, congratulations uh, for all the work that you and your teams are doing in unimaginable circumstances you are fighting a war and at the same time you deliver justice on the ground you have our full support uh, from the union level from Eurojustice we are supporting you at international level but it's so important that you get everything you need in terms of experts in terms of IT equipment in terms of uh, protective equipment for your staff that goes on the ground um, the work that you're doing is uh, outstanding and it's really it's the most important um, element in this 
immediate response to the call for justice. The second um, part of, of uh, using existing structures, of course, is also uh, ensuring cooperation amongst our member states, then also cooperation with Ukraine, cooperation with the ICC. And that's done in Eurojust uh, in this joint investigation team. It sounds very technical, but it's incredibly important because you need to make sure where do you have the evidence? Uh, and, and the prosecutor generally referred to that. We need to, to collect the evidence. That's what we are doing in this uh, uh, um, uh, CISET database in Eurojust, where we are collecting the different participants. What kind of evidence do we have? Then to discuss with each other who is prosecuting which crime, uh, and then making sure that uh, uh, the country that is closest to the crime has most of the evidence takes it forwards. Very concrete, very technical, but at the same time so important to deliver really justice on the ground. And that is working extremely well. Um, it's um, still behind the scenes, but lots of investigations are going on, of course, first and foremost in Ukraine, but also in more than half of our EU member states. There are investigations going on uh, for all kinds of reasons, sometimes because uh, a national of those countries is concerned, sometimes because they have universal jurisdiction, uh, but very important to pull the different pieces together. At the same time, we have um, the, the, the dimension of the crimes is um, indeed since the Second World War uh, unimaginable, unfortunately, but therefore also the, the um, uh, victims, uh, the numbers are outrageous. Luckily, we have also many NGOs, civil society that is helping to support those victims and also collect the evidence. But very important that we are different networks that we have, the genocide network, for example. We are advising the NGOs how to interview the victims that they are not um, interviewed again and again. You don't want to uh, re-victimize them. So it's very important, this kind of down-to-earth pragmatic uh, work. Part of the, and that's the third level, part of um, uh, this joint investigation team is also the ICC. And also the ICC um, has a very important role. If the ICC were competent for the crime of aggression as they are for the war crimes, the crimes against humanity and uh, genocide, we didn't have any gap. And uh, indeed, as we have seen from the arrest warrants against Putin and uh, Lova Belova, the ICC is investigating. They take part in this joint investigation team, again, to see what kind of evidence can we share, how can we help each other to build cases, and then make sure that uh, uh, the criminals, wherever in the command chain, are taken to justice. So uh, this, um, uh, for the use of existing structures, uh, very important because those tools exist today. And as we can see from the arrest warrants by the ICC, they go up to the highest level. So in principle, let's say we have tools to cover the entire range up to the, the Troika in Russia, of course. And that uh, leads me now to my second element, to the question of the crime of aggression. The crime of aggression, the leadership crime, has a different status. If the ICC were competent for this crime of aggression, which only can be committed by the leadership, we didn't have a uh, gap in terms of accountability. It's not by chance that the crime of aggression is treated differently from the other three core international crimes. That was an intentional choice of the global community when they created the, the ICC. Of course, if, and that happened in the past, if you have a country violating brutally the Charter of the United Nations and you have uh, not somebody in the uh, Security Council that has a veto right, then the Security Council can refer the matter to the ICC and still the ICC can prosecute that country for the crime of aggression. However, um, here we have a permanent member of the Security Council that can block. So this route is closed. The ICC is not competent for the crime of aggression. And indeed, um, you always call it rightly so that the mother of all crimes, it's the leadership crime. Let's say that was the first step before then the individual crimes were committed. So how can we go after that? Again, two elements. First is um, the collection of evidence. And the second is then creating the tribunal. On the first step, creating and uh, collecting the evidence. Um, as at the moment, we didn't have any structure to ensure the accountability on the crime of aggression. Um, together with um, the Ukrainians and also other international partners, we Europeans said, listen, we can create this international center for the prosecution of the crime of aggression that the prosecutor general mentioned already at Eurojust in The Hague. This um, is 
let's say, hooked on uh, our agency, which normally only supports EU member states. But here we give Europe just an international task, and it is an international effort to, again, see what kind of evidence do we have. And this is something uh, which is very important. This ICPA started operating before the summer. Um, and thanks for Ukraine, that delegated all the six prosecutors. Uh, EU member states delegated prosecutors, US uh, sent one prosecutor, uh, now we are filling the staff, and up to end of the year, the ICPA will be fully operational. That's a very important point because, again, it sends the message, even up to the leadership, that we are already collecting the evidence against you um, as of now. Even if the second step, setting up the tribunal, will take a bit more time, we are collecting the evidence now, we are preparing the cases, like the ICC did for, for Putin and uh, Lover Belover, so is the ICPA precisely on the crime of aggression collecting the necessary evidence. The second step then will be to set up the tribunal, and their discussions are still ongoing. Um, it's not an easy one. Um, I would say that in our discussions also at global level, um, most um, agree on the need to do it. But even there, we have to make sure that it's not perceived as just a European effort uh, to ensure accountability for the crimes in Ukraine is a much broader issue, and you uh, mentioned that repeatedly, it's a global effort. So we need to make sure that it's not just a few European countries, that it's a global uh, effort and global endorsement for the second step. Uh, how can we get there? Different models are being discussed at the moment. Um, the co uh, really, the key group to discuss this is the core group, where more than 40 countries are cooperating. From G7 countries, of course, Ukraine is there, uh, EU member states, and we are reflecting together what is the best way forward. Is it an international tribunal? Is it a kind of hybrid tribunal? I noted that you said uh, no hybrid piece, so I guess you also meant uh, no, no hybrid tribunal. Is it some kind of, let's say, other solution? But let's say the, there the reflections are still going on. Um, we hope to, to reach um, some kind of understanding consensus with our global partners and, of course, first and foremost, Ukraine relatively soon before the end of the year. But again, very important that in the meantime, the ICPA started operating, collecting evidence, precisely to ten, uh, send these measures that not only for uh, crime, uh, war crimes, crime against humanity, uh, uh, genocide, but also for the crime of aggression, everybody will be held accountable. And with that, back to you, Amanda. Thank you very much, Neil. This was, this was a much bigger answer than I was expecting, but a marvellous answer because you touched on so many um, important issues. Um, I'm aware that we basically ran out of time, but I want to give the audience um, the chance to put their questions. So if you have a question, can you please flag it up? Yeah, the gentleman in the middle, because for the journalists, um, we'll do the we'll do you afterwards, if I can put it that way. Yeah, in the middle here, the the, the guy with the um the grey shirt. Um yeah, I just wanted to uh, say thank you for the interesting discussions and can you just tell us where you're from and who you are? I'm um I'm Alexander, I'm um, working at the ESC, that's the European Economic and Social Committee. I'm uh, half Ukrainian. I like professionally. I don't have anything to do with um, peace building or with accountability, but um, I was still very interested in the topic. Um, actually, I'm a bit surprised that I got uh, to ask the questions so soon, so I need to uh, formulate in my head. Um, I wanted to ask you a, que a question to you, Ms. Abraham, um, because you um, you were pointing out the importance of. Um, overcoming um, the tra um, traumatization of the Ukrainian civil society and the population. And I just wanted to ask you um, which um, which measures or which, um, yeah, what is the EU, EU planning on doing, this, um, on doing for that? And we just have a question um, over here as well. Yeah. My name is Svetlana Taran. I'm an EPC research fellow. I'm from Ukraine, from Kiev School of Economics as well. 
And my question is about uh, a confiscation of Russian uh, sanctioned uh, Russian assets. This is another dimension of uh, delivering justice and uh, making Russia accountable and paying for uh, for its crimes. Uh, would you please tell us maybe in very short uh, what are the positive developments with these issues? Because this issue is, uh, uh, I know that it, it is still discussed uh, being discussed a lot and maybe there is no yet final decisions on it but maybe uh, you can uh, tell us uh, what ukraine expects and what are thank you okay maybe i'll give the floor back to you um prosecutor general um the <clears throat> the response is very simple it's very easy to do if there is a political will um it's very easy to do with the sovereign assets. The number of the amount of which uh, will be enough or will be at least close to the amount necessary to pay compensation for all victims and survivors of this war to the local community, to the state, to the business who suffered from, from this war. Easy because legally it's about taking adopting legislation which allows to confiscate sovereign assets a little bit more complicated with private assets while the difference is that for private assets we have already successful cases in us and some others are ongoing we have like half uh, successful i mean successful in nature but we are waiting for the decision of court in canada but the amounts of these pieces of confiscation are not enough to cover the, the damage. My colleagues from the European Union will probably argue that it's not an easy story. Yeah. yeah, but once again, from legal point of view, it's an easy one if there is a political will. The issue, the most difficult issue in uh, creation of proper model of special tribunal for the crime of aggression is an issue of personal immunity of so-called Troika. And this personal immunity, if it will, if there will be no decision to overcome it legally, will lead to impunity of this people, including Putin, I think, which is not in interest of all of us. The same relates to the sovereign assets. There is a concept of the sovereign immunity of sovereign assets, which in order to overcome, you just need to adopt the law. Of course, taking a risk about of counteraction from Russia against countries who will be brave. And this is, once again, about first political will and then proper risk assessment. If, for instance, the specific country is can confiscate sovereign assets of like 100x amount and can lose as a matter of counteraction just x amount, then probably this risk should be taken and political will should be higher than legal potential legal constraints. And once again, if sovereign immunity, respect to sovereign immunity of aggressor state will be supported by the countries who already have frozen the assets, then once again, it will lead to impunity for the point of view of compensation of damage of Ukraine and Ukrainians. On the other side, great work has been done. So a lot of sanctions imposed, a lot of assets has been frozen, yeah. and task forces of different countries and institutions are looking about the other assets to be frozen in order to ensure potential compensation. Register of damage is already uh, established. The two other elements of compensation mechanism, which is compensation commission and compensation fund 
are on the way. It will take some time, but we understand that they will be in place. But the only thing, if we will have compensation fund, how to fill in this fund with 100x amount of assets in order to provide compensation to victims and survivors. Some uh, propositions, uh, I would say, in between are discussed and the initiative, for instance, of the government of Belgium to use the taxes from profits on arrested Russian sovereign assets is good initiative, is good step forward. But this is the simplest decision because it does not require any legislative changes. It's just about political will to share with Ukraine the money which is uh, which belongs to the government of Belgium as a taxes on profit raised on Russian arrested uh, assets. But even this first step related to sovereign assets is an important step because it is an example which could be followed by the others. The next step is potentially what to do with the income on the on the um, uh, um, uh, on the assets which are under arrest. There is still a discussion whether income uh, has um, enjoy the same sovereign immunity. I hope that the discussion will lead to an understanding that income should not be saved as a matter of fact to if we will need then at some stage to return back these assets to aggressor state. Not we, I mean, but the countries who arrested it. Because I hardly believe any politician will take this responsibility of any European country to return back these assets at some stage, and especially profit raised on these assets. So we are on the way, not very fast, but I hope that this ice will be also broken at some stage. Thank you. I'll give the floor to you now, Iris. Uh, thank you. I'll keep it short. Actually, um, in all um, crises that the EU works with, we have as part of our programming, particularly for children, um, we have psychosocial support included. So this is really part of our post-conflict uh, reconstruction efforts across the our programming, be it with our uh, interpart partnerships or particularly also with with Nia, who is now really holding a lot of uh, of the pen, a lot of the work when it comes to to support inside inside Ukraine, and already inside the EU since the beginning of of the war, when children started to come to the EU, and you remember there were many, um, each member state that also received children made child protection and psychosocial support an integral part of their of their work with children of their um, protection of these children. Um, this is a long process, and one needs to also realize that as longer this war will last, the longer will be the trauma be built up uh, within the children. So a big part is also for member states to find this fine balance where uh, children can keep the connection with their home country. Um, they follow online courses. They keep that connection. They need to, of course, be also able to follow the Ukrainian curriculum that when they go back, they can continue and on that path and contribute. But at the same time, psychologically, to have a sense of normalcy, to have the feeling to be able to be a child again, they also need to be sort of part of that normal life in an EU member state, going to school, going to birthdays, making friends, because that helps. That helps. But while this is all going on, uh, there needs to be also a preparation for when they go back what they will find, what they will not find. And this is something to be done together with the parents, with the caretakers, with the teachers. As part of our work also, we will work clearly with social workers. This is an aspect that needs to be part of the reconstruction, um, this entire aspect of social work. Um, these capacities need to be built up, how to deal with it. And there's also parts, but then I, I, I will stop. I don't want to go too much into that. Look also at uh, former combatants that will come back. They have also incurred trauma. They need to integrate their families as well. There needs to be a normal life that needs to be, up, be built up. So there's an entire societal fabric that needs to be addressed. And that's why we really also urge that as part of the reconstruction, that's a note to ourselves, but also to, to our partners in Ukraine and international partners, that we do not forget this aspect. Thank you. Thank you. A last word, uh, Nils? 
on the question of the assets, um, the <laughs> prosecutor general has already comprehensively uh, addressed the issue. Indeed, it's still complex. Uh, we are trying hard. On, on many points, I totally agree. On some issues, I would say, indeed, they are complex. So let's have another EBC meeting. Definitely, in before six months. Um, so I'd like to thank all of you very much, but especially to you, Prosecutor General, um, for joining us here today and to talking about this topic, because, because quite honestly, in my opinion, there's not enough focus um, on this issue. I mean, in Brussels or any other capital, I mean, we have a lot of focus on military aid, um, the Grain Deal, and all these things, of course, are really important to talk about, but I think there definitely needs to be a much bigger push um, to give more visibility to this topic, because um, as we heard, the absolutely grotesque and barbaric crimes that are committed um, by Russia every single day, every five minutes um, in Ukraine, deserve to get much more attention, whether it's on the you know, newspapers, in these sorts of events, or any other sort of um, activity. So I do believe there's a need, maybe even for a global tour, um on on these things to promote these things i mean the, the issue of kidnapped kids i don't think it's well enough known quite honestly um throughout the world so thank you very much for joining us um i don't doubt that ukraine will get justice they have to get justice russia must be held um accountable so thanks to you all and the last thing that we of course always have to say is slava ukraine Heroim slava